dependence, speaks volume about the measurement of laboratory imparted remnants. David, right. you can share your screen and it's all yours. All right, um, let's see if I... Just have to remember how to do that. I'm not shared, huh? <laughs> okay, hold on. Not yet. Okay. Does that, that work? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm going to talk about switching field angular dependence and its influence on the measurement of anhistoriatic remnants. Um, we could just as well talk about IRMs or GRMs, but perhaps ARMs are the most interesting. Uh, to start here, um, I have this little cartoon showing, the crit showing that the critical field required to flip the moment of an elongate particle is dependent on the angle between the particle long axis and the applied field direction. And what I show here is the most general case where the applied field is most effective when it's applied along the particle long axis. Okay, so in the box here, I have rearranged the switching field equation from Aha Roni 1986 to plot this curve below. And this plot shows the maximum particle corrosivity activated as a function of angle between the applied field direction and the particle long axis. Um, so it's a really useful plot and Aha Roni's equation includes this alpha parameter, which experimentally was found to be about 0.9 for, for magnetite, fine grain magnetite. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna use 0.9 in, in modeling. Okay, so now I've replotted this curve and I've inserted little grains to highlight that this plot provides a useful means of viewing coercivity orientation distribution of a population of activated particles that could carry an ARM. <clears throat> and for example, here I plot a P ARM imparted as the AF decayed from 100 to 80 millitesla. And you could see that particles that were activated within this window uh, have coercivities that extend far below 80 millitesla. So this is obviously important for um, you know, the inclination correction that we've been talking about quite a lot. Oops, Ooh, spoiled my joke. <laughs> okay, um, so I want to introduce you to the cone of activation, um, but let's first look at this plot on the right. The ARM that is shown here could have been imparted in two ways. One option is by first applying a total ARM up to 100 millitesla, and then tumble demagnetizing up to 80 millitesla, or it could just be imparted by giving one ARM up to 100 millitesla if the sample's coercivity distribution was entirely restricted to this 100 to 80 millitesla range. So this plot you know, could be either of those two scenarios. So looking to the left, I show an isotropic distribution of particle long axes on a stereo net, and the red circle the cone of activation encompasses all particles that were activated by the field and available to be biased um, to be uh, included in the ARM. And any particle outside of this circle uh, would not contribute to the magnetization. And <laughs> just pointing out here that the idea to plot a cone of activation on a stereo net is not new. Okay, so let's define activation degree as the percentage of particles activated out of the total number of particles available to be activated. And for this activation degree, you could think of the sample as a whole or think of individual coercivity windows. So here's that plot again, um, ARM given to a peak of 100 millitesla. This ARM did not fully activate the whole sample. So this ARM would be considered partially activating. 
but the partially activated ARM can be subdivided into a lower fully activated portion and a higher uh, coercivity partially activated portion. And this line here plots the, the boundary between these two states. Okay, so I wanna introduce a simple analogy that I think will help, help you grasp some of these ideas. Uh, this analogy makes the assumption that a change in magnetization resulting from a change in activation degree is roughly equivalent to a change in magnetization that would result from a change in sample size. It's just to help uh, understand some ideas. And, you know, in this example here, I show that, uh, you know, when, when the sample itself is anisotropic, the activation degree is also dependent on field orientation. And this is what we called in our last paper, an anisotropy in the concentration of activated grains. And I think it, we used that name because Rob Coe likes to say ACAG. <laughs> I think that's how we settled on that one. Um, okay, so uh, get to our first application being the measurement of coercivity distribution via progressive demagnetization. And here I'm showing from left to right, a progressive demagnetization of a partially activating ARM, the one I've been showing you. Um, in these first two plots, the remnants that's being removed is fully activating. Um, and then to the right, it becomes increasingly less activated at higher AF steps. So yeah, we're demagnet demagnetizing the sample going to the right. Um, and as you move past this activation line, it results in a loss of this apparent volume with increasing AF step level. And by consequence, the remnants removed above this activation line is not comparable with that which had been removed below the line. So accurate coercivity distributions can only be measured in this fully activated uh, region of the coercivity of the ARM. Okay, second uh, application, suitability ARM is a TRM proxy. Um, so now at the bottom here, I show that same ARM demagnetization. And at the top, uh, a TRM demagnetization. And it's important to note that there is no directionality to thermal activation. And as a result, TRMs are always fully activated throughout the entire coercivity distribution. Um, so with progressive demagnetization, once you cross this, this activation line on the ER ARM, your TRM ARM ratio is gonna skyrocket. So here's some real data of a TRM ARM ratio measured during progressive demagnetization. And this is from synthetic, a synthetic sample containing fine grain magnetite. And sure enough, it, it goes up. And one question is why isn't the first ratio measured prior to demagnetization? Why isn't that not closer to one? And the answer, part of the answer is because this part of that magnetization was in this first measurement. So here's this plot again. Um, and you can see now the region of the ARM that gives you an accurate TRM ratio and one that gives you an amplified ratio. So this ARM as a whole would be considered partially activating and would yield an amplified ratio prior to demagnetization. Um, though I should point out that unless you had some extreme coercivity distribution, this switching field property wouldn't come close to reducing that ratio from 10 down to one. So while what I'm saying is a factor, it's, there's obviously other things that need considering. Um, okay, so the last topic, ARM anisotropy. And when we do ARM anisotropy, we normally assume 
the anisotropy is represented by a perfect ellipsoid. And with this assumption, we could use tensor analysis to find the principal components of this ellipsoid from a set of measured ARMs. And so these plots here show the property where addition of any two perfect ellipsoids yields another perfect ellipsoid. And similarly, addition of two non-ellipsoidal shapes yields another non-ellipsoidal shape. So we can say that um, any type of magnetization that is suitable for tensor analysis could never be used to detect a composite fabric, at least at the, at the sample level. So you couldn't see these higher order anisotropy shapes. And on the left here, I show a Starinet, which has a composite fabric consisting of two orthogonal lineations. And I used this anisotropy as a model input and applied 1,000 uniformly oriented, fully activating ARMs. And as expected, the resultant shape was a perfect ellipsoid. And the, the composite fabric was not at all detect, uh, detectable. So then I repeat the same model, but use 1,000 partially activating ARMs. In this case, the result is not an ellipsoid and it can characterize that higher order anisotropy shape. And it's easy to see why this is the case when looking at the change in apparent volume as a function of field orientation. So the anisotropy in the concentration of activated grains. Okay, so here I show some real measurements that Mikhail Vak just sent me last week um, from the sushi bar and both sets of measurements were made on the same sample using two different experimental designs. On the left, these ARMs were closer to being fully activating. They weren't fully activating, but they were much closer. On the right, they were much farther from being fully activating. So this is, uh, yeah, much, this is essentially what we're gonna use as our partially activating case. And this is the fully activating case. Okay. So in both cases, ARMs were measured in 61 directions on one hemisphere. And when we include their antipodes, we have 122 directions. While 122 directions is a lot, the shape is still just easier to see if I interpolate and create 2000 directions. So I'm just gonna be using the interpolated shape going forward. Um, so now I'm gonna model these real measurements using reasonable input estimates for switching field angular dependence, coercivity distribution, and sample anisotropy. And the model uses the exact same measurement routines as that used by the sushi bar. And here is the, uh, the experiment where the ARM was closer to being fully activating the anisotropy in both, case, both cases um, is nearly ellipsoidal. And in both cases, I rotated the anisotropy shape and added it back to itself to show that the sum of the two uh, is also nearly ellipsoidal, meaning this experimental routine is close to being suitable for tensor analysis, but is poorly designed for measuring higher order anisotropy shapes. And now I model the experimental routine where each ARM had a moderately low activation degree and the resulting shape uh, departs from an ellipsoid. You could tell it's got these cute little dimples on the sides. <laughs> uh, and when you rotate and add the thing back to itself, it produces a higher order anisotropy shape. Um, and it's just, it, it's beautiful how much the modeling and the real measurements uh, compare. So this being our first test, we were, we were really conservative about how much we attempted to reduce the activation degree. Um, but in the next test we'll run, we'll be able to lower this activation degree significantly farther and better characterize composite fabrics. Um, we will also run samples that actually have composite fabrics rather than just adding two together. But I wanted to start with a sample I knew really well 
So what can we say? Partially activating ARMs can measure composite fabrics, but are not suitable for tensor analysis um, in detail. Uh, this composite fabric method can be tuned to specific coercivity windows. This particular lack of tensor suitability is independent of the linearity between the weak biasing field strength and the resultant magnetization. And in most cases, our typical single ARM applications are not suitable for tensor analysis. Uh, we go back to this plot. And you could see now the ARM divided into, you know, coercivity segments that are suitable for tensor analysis and those that are not. Um, okay, how much time? A little bit more time. All right. So now I'm showing uh, various models which use three partially activating ARMs to calculate anisotropy. Um, and I use only three because that'll highlight the problems with tensor analysis. Um, so on the left here, the principal anisotropy axes are aligned with the three ARM axes, and the degree of anisotropy was amplified from 3.5 to 10.6. And we showed <clears throat> this specific scenario in our, in our last uh, paper on this topic. And, you know, I'm, I'm partly using these large anisotropies so you could just look at the, the plot and see it. So it's, you know, you could easily see it in the graphics. Um, so in the middle, uh, the anisotropy and ARM axes are at high angles to each other and the estimated degree of anisotropy is reduced. And on the right, the axes are at moderate angles to each other and the estimated degree of anisotropy has improved, but the directions now have uh, quite a bit of error. Um, the blue symbols are the measured through the three ARMs and the white symbols are the true uh, anisotropy from Josef Jezek's orientation tensor, which is an, a nice trick. Um, so this anisotropy is a perfect lineation. So we only really care about looking at the squares if you're thinking about direction. Okay, so here I repeat this model using the same three anisotropies, but I, now I have 15 partially activating ARMs. And in this case, the directions were all estimated well, but the anisotropy is still a little high. And what I see is the um, increasing the number of ARM directions reduces error, but an infinite number of ARMs will not converge exactly uh, toward the correct answer. And, you know, the sister topic to this is IRMs and particularly SIRMs. And, you know, a lot of people were talking about how to use them. And SIRMs are beautiful because from a modeling standpoint, they're so simple um, to understand. Uh, so I think there's a lot of promise with using SIRMs, but maybe we don't, and, and with this too, we don't need to use tensor analysis, if we can model them really easily, <laughs> really easily, then we can iterate the model to fit the measured measurements to the uh, modeled results. And then from that, we'll know in the model what the anisotropy was. But SIRMs are super simple as well, and it relates to this. Okay, some final comments, uh, the apparent volume analogy applies to any remnants measurement preceded by an application of a partially activating or non-saturating magnetic field. And if the analogy is not considered, uh, or if it is, but the presumed sufficient field, angular dependence is grossly incorrect, uh, then unrecognized errors may lead to data misinterpretation. And um, yeah, I'll just, I'll leave it here. I think I'm out of, out of time. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, very interesting talk, perhaps raises a lot of questions and second questioning our certain of our, our methods, but that's a good point of these types of, of meetings. Um, anybody have any questions?
I, I have a question, what? Franz. Yeah. Uh, or it, it's it's more of a comment that I worry about. You know, this was a thing that that Lisa Tokes asked about barriers, right? And and whether ARM, you know, is is already giving us some kind of a bias. And essentially how I would answer that, this gets to David's point about the IRM and why I worry about IRM, right? And it's because the higher in field we go, like higher in energy we go, we can arrive at a, at a higher energy point, right? We can go out of equilibrium more with higher fields. And this is why I always worry with the IRM is that we're not just looking at the single domain grains that are holding our remnants, but we're also looking at the multi-domain grain fraction with the IRMs. And, and that's why I worry about the IRM. Um, you know, like, like I worry about it. David, did you want to comment? If not, uh, Adrian Muxworthy has a, has a question for you. All right. Uh, no, I, I agree with Stu. I guess I don't have any any comment on that. Okay, Adrian. So you need to unmute yourself, or you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. <laughs> there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. So I'm on my iPad, that's all. Um, okay, thanks, thanks very much for the talk. Um, I, have a, I, have a, I have a question about your model. I, I'm just thinking back to a paper by Pfeiffer in 1990 where they have coercivity as a function of angle. And if I remember rightly, the equation actually, it peaks in the middle at 45 degrees, not, not, not at zero. So if you have coercivity versus the intrinsic coercivity of the sample, that it, Varies as a function of the angle, and the angle is at 45. So it means that your model that you're using, the schematic sort of diagram you're using, was not really agreement with what's in in the literature. I just I just wasn't was sure if you're aware of that. That was all. It might not affect your conclusions because you still got the same sort of ideas going on. It's just that the, there'd be a shift. Yeah. 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 Um, so that would you're talking about Stoner Wolfhart model. Yes, uh, Donald Volthart theory, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So with that, you know, going off, um, if you guys still see my screen, uh, there's a couple of reasons I, I don't do it exactly. Um, so this screen, so Stephenson was the first real paper that I saw where he tested it. Um, and when he did experiments on a huge range of magnetite particles, uh, he couldn't explain that at all with the Stone and Wolfarth model, but it fit perfectly the Aha Roni equation. Um, also, Matson had a few papers, really nice papers, came to the same conclusion. Um, and then I've done loads of experiments, modeled it both ways. And, you know, if I included, if I did Stone and Wolfarth, I would never have this match. You're right, though, this, the, the, it would still be there, but the effects would be much, much reduced. Um, so with, the, with that model, you get the same sort of thing happening, but you would never characterize this shape as well. It would look much, much more like a perfect ellipse. So the fact that this modeling um, matches the real result, just for this type of experiment and for all the stuff Stephenson did and Matson. Um, is why I go with Aha Roni's equation. But I should say that I don't really understand what alpha is. And I could also model this with having a mixture of Aha Roni and Stoner Wolfarth particles. Um, and, you know, lowering alpha from one you can kind of explain that by throwing in more of those stone and wolf art particles. Um, so in a way I do, you know, I do include that relationship you mentioned I could and get the same answers if I did a mixture of, if I had alpha equal to one 
and say 20% stone and wool particles, uh, then I can start reproducing the same stuff. Okay. Yeah, I hope that answered it. Sonia, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, so while we're on this slide um, and you're using this Aroni expression to calculate the fully activated region, so is if you're trying to do an ARM paleo intensity on a sample, is a possible workaround to just increase the AC field to some like very, very high number, in which case maybe you'd have a more accurate paleo intensity determination for the AF levels you actually care about? Or is, <laughs> is that like the logical conclusion from this or is there, yeah. um, or is that yeah. still problematic? <laughs> um, that's exactly, I mean, I, I kind of ran out of time, but the next thing I was gonna say is the solution is using the more powerful AF field. Um, so that that is the solution and Walter Schillinger built this uh, new design for um, AFD magger that has a magnetic core, goes up to half a Tesla now, and he thinks he can get up to one Tesla. So that's, that's really, um, that's gonna be useful. But the other thing that I should mention is that, you know, theoretically, you gotta stay in this fully activated region, but in practice, you know, all the particles that are at really high angles to the field direction, have very little contribution to the magnetization. So there's a lot of fudge room where within practice, like where you wanna, uh, <laughs> what you're gonna start believing. Cause like what I'm hovering over right here contributes very, very little to the magnetization. Um, so this line in practice could come up a little bit, which will give us some more room to play with our ARMs. <laughs> And I don't know if I can squeeze in a follow up on this, but with your new uh, kind of ARM system, um, do you have like errors? If you're using like, a, let's say a weaker bias field relative to this extremely high AC field, like do you get any kind of harmonics or ARM noise which make your bias field like inaccurate in terms of what you know, you're actually applying versus what you're trying to apply? Yeah, well, I haven't used it all that much. Um, yeah. There was a little a, a fire and a, a damaged electronic component, so we haven't. It hasn't been working, um, but uh, I do think those things are a real problem. After Stu started mentioning his observations, and that was the first time I've ever seen anything like that. Um, but I would think the solution is um, if you set up like in our automated system. Uh, what I think would be a really nice solution to that ARM bias problem is we can, when it's finished, you can go quickly between the AFD magger and the cryo, move in right away. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way for me to see an unwanted ARM bias is looking at the viscous decay. Um, so you can quickly throw that in there and look at the viscous decay. Do you have something decaying off in AF direction? And then in the magnetometer itself, it makes sense to me to build in uh, an artificial bias to compensate for that. Um, and the way that bias should work is, it's not like a typical bias you'd use in an ARM that hits some fixed intensity over some AF window. Uh, this bias would always be rescaling to maintain, um, it rescales proportionally with the peak AF. Um, so as your AF ramps up, this counterbalancing bias uh, will ramp up too. So it scales with the AF, just like we would think the unwanted ARM bias would. So if you have that programmed into the magnetometer where you could twiddle how, <laughs> fiddle around with how large that is, and you repetitively apply AFs, throw it in the cryo, measure the ARM viscous decay, and then start changing how much compensation bias you're giving it until you could you know, hit it with the AF and then you see no viscous, viscous decay on the, uh, in the AF direction. Um, and I think that could be something that you calibrate to the magnetometer once, but yeah, but I think that's important. Thank you. Uh, Richard, you, did you wanna voice out your question? Uh, uh, not necessarily, I was just, going back to what Adrian was asking about and, and, and the, 
the Stoner Wolfarth model. But I guess that that paper you mentioned that the quoted size range for the magnetites was was way beyond the single domain threshold. So I guess that is why they obey different laws. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that that's one thing, you know, that's the important thing, I think that I don't have a, a really good hold on, like, theoretically, why is that alpha there? Or, you know, why do we have this simple equation from Aha Rooney? What I can do is I could take it at face value, model it and match it to measurements. Um, I could test it. And that's kind of what Matson and Stephenson did. Um, but they didn't, you know, argue for it theoretically. I don't, I don't think in a big way. Um, and the real problem, which comes out right away when you start to model this, and what Matson showed, is that, you know, with the Aharoni equation, there's a real change um, in in coercivity. Or what am I? What am I trying to say? Not changing coercivity. The if you model things with a stoner Wolfarth um, group of particles, then a single AF application is going to be much, much closer to fully activating everything. And when you see what you see with the models is that um, if you're demagnetizing, say, with a single AF direction along the remnants, the stoner Wolfarth uh, particles, it looks like you're tumble demagnetizing because it's so efficient in the model. And with the aha roni, it becomes much harder to demagnetize with a single AF direction. Um, and it, it's just that sort of thing. You could play around with modeling and comparing real demagnetizations and ARMs and IRMs and how they overlap. And there's loads of ways you can constrain, uh, constrain this stuff because the stoner wolf art has predictions over here, and then aha roni is over here. And we make these measurements using exactly or we model it exactly the way we did it in the lab. And we always see it's over by Aha Rooney. Um, and, you know, it, that's for me with the Snake River Plain samples that I'm, you know, that's something else. I don't, I haven't worked on all types of rocks. You know, I've been mainly focusing on Snake River Plain rock. And that's where I see this clearly. Um, but Stephenson and Matson, they worked on a larger variety of lithology. Okay, well, I think uh, this probably wraps up this session. I want to thank uh, Suzanne and I want to thank uh, all the speakers for the great talks, uh, Andrea, Ken, Dario, Stuart, and, and David. Um, I think maybe Max or, oh, am I? No, maybe Max or, um, Bruce wanted to say any closing remarks or? Um, yes, if I just go first um, about this, the poster session tomorrow. Um, so the poster session begins at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Savings Time. So that's Minnesota time. And it's a two hour session um, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the session is going to start here in the Zoom. So first of all, come to the Zoom link. Um, and we'll be playing the lightning talks for that poster session. And then um, I'll lead you through about how we're going to get into the gather and actually do the poster session from there. So the first part of the poster session will be the lightning talk. So please come to the Zoom room at the beginning. Um, Bruce, do you have anything? Um, yeah, I just want to follow up and, and just say um, thanks for everyone to, for participating and thank all the speakers for giving uh, enlightening talks um, today. And we hope to uh, see you all tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. I, yep. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, Franz and Suzanne, for convening. Thanks. You're very welcome. Hey, Max. Yes. Can you stay on? Yes. See you guys all tomorrow. Thank Max you. is just